Good evening. It's an honor and a privilege to be here speaking at this university. And also another of the feelings I have very strongly is one of gratitude for the very true kindness has, that has been shown to my husband and myself. Uh, before we ever arrived here, the, the op good offices of Sterling Yates and his team, and I wanted to, to, to acknowledge that in public, uh, before I begin to deal now with our subject matter. That is a Jewish custom, to honor your host before you begin to speak. And so that is my introduction. I'm talking about imagination, imagining Moses. Ima what is the basis on which it's legitimate to take a character who is described in a text and then to begin to apply a kind of free range of motion to that character as if he has, he has the ability to move in ways that are not apparent in the text. Mostly, he has the ability to display depths which are not so obvious in the text. Sometimes those depths need some kind of help in order, and often it's the literary, it's the literary function of the text to indicate that there are hidden depths beneath the words. I want to suggest that Hebrew is an extraordinarily evocative language in this respect. That if you don't know Hebrew, you have certainly understood something of the narratives, but you have missed a great deal. What you have missed is the depths. And that genre that's called midrashic writing, midrashic narratives, focuses on a very close reading of those Hebrew words in order to reveal depths. Now, when it comes to considering Moses as a liminal figure, I'm going to be looking at liminality, which is a rather pretentious word now that's much in fashion but it has a very serious meaning. In order to do that, I want to make a distinction to start with. Liminality is often used in anthropology, in anthropological studies. That's its origin. To describe the position of an outsider who is just outside, just on the threshold of a meaningful place and isn't inside. He's outside and he's on the threshold. He's standing there. And that describes something about the structural position of that outsider. He's neither quite inside nor quite out, but perhaps any moment now he will come into it. Perhaps he's being initiated. There are rituals uh, in anthropological procedures. Uh, there are rituals that help us understand the, such a position. When I say that Moses occupies a liminal position, a liminal posture, right? that's perhaps a better word, that he has a liminal posture, I'm talking about something more intense than that. It's not purely structural. It has to do with a way of experiencing oneself. It's a kind of out of jointness about oneself. I'm not quite this and I'm not quite that. Yeah, I'm not quite Scottish and I'm not quite a Jew. Somewhere inside and out, I happen to be a Scottish Jew going back to my upbringing here in Scotland. And the sense of liminality is somewhere a sense of discomfort, one has to acknowledge it, and a sense of questioning oneself rather than the society, of questioning oneself, why am I like this? That's a, a formulation of the question, which is vague, but somewhere expresses for me that kind of discomfort that sense of appealing for some sense of being at home in a situation that never ceases to feel slightly uncanny. Slightly, I mean, I'm not quite there. I'm attached, but I'm excluded. So it becomes a very personal psychological experience. Uh, Stephen Frosch, working at Birkbeck College in London, has written a wonderful book called Hauntings. And it's from him that I take that distinction. Like a ghost, a ghost is not quite there and it's not quite gone. It's somehow, it's, it's there. And that does sound like a deathly and an unpromising role for me to consider Moses from. But as I want to show, 
that situation of being not quite, not just, not just this, not just that, can actually be quite a fertile position. It's a position from which many good things emerge in a difficult way feeling of being out of joint. And that's one of the expressions that I, I find very, very helpful. Somehow out of joint. Not quite covered, this is Slavoj Žižek's uh, definition, uh, not quite covered by the symbolic. I don't really have a home, a full home in language. Language can't completely describe where I am. And so there's a sense of being exposed to something that is un un unachieved by language. So what I want to do this evening, and I've taken a fair amount of time to do it, and I, I hope we'll manage to bear the extra, the few extra minutes that I'm asking for of your time. Um, what I want to do then is to look at six scenes, which I think of as the major obvious scenes of Moses' life. Moses' life with the people. It's the seven ages of man, and these are the six stages of Moshe, of Moses. And so I begin with the beginning. Yes, the beginning is who first sees Moshe? Who first sees Moses? Throughout these stages, someone will be looking at Moses, and Moses will be looking at the world. Right. There's a sense of being seen, of seeing and being seen. The first scene I want to bring into play here is right at the beginning of the story, chapter 2 of Exodus, when Moses is exposed, he is put out into the river by his sister Miriam uh, in a well-covered and protected little box, teva, that's all it is, a clay-covered box. And there he is floating on the river of death without benefit of sail, or rudder, waiting for what will happen. And then the princess sees him from the land, and she sends a, nur a, wet nur a nurse, to, uh, a servant, to go and find, her, find, find him, bring him in. And then we have this description. I'll read it very, very briefly. She saw the box in the middle of the reeds, and she sent her maidservant to, to go and get it. And then she opened the box, and she saw it. First she'd seen the box, and then she saw him, it, vatir ehu. She sees him. Who? The child, etayeled. Now that's a double object. She sees him, the child. Can't, can't it be said more simply? The child. And behold, it was a boy crying. Now that's disjointed. There's a sense of, why do you need all these attempts to say something? It could have been put more in a more flowing, simple way. So is this a child, or is it a na'ar, the Medrash asks, distinguishing between the two words that are used to describe Moses. I understand it's a child, obviously. It's a baby. But what's the na'ar doing here? Na'ar is the word, usually, for a youth, an adolescent boy. It seems inappropriate for a baby to call him a nar. And what is this nar doing? He's crying. He's weeping, like all babies do. Nothing terribly special about that. But what, how does the princess react? She takes pity on it, and she says, this must be one of the children of the Hebrews. Now, that is a perfect vignette, as, as I hear it, of compassion of someone who looks and then looks again. She sees one thing, the superficial aspect of it. She, sees, she looks again, and then her looking is a way of imagining the child, going further than, than the child itself. It's not just a crying baby, right? That would be the simplest understanding of the scene. Babies cry, yes. No, this is a, a baby who is not really a baby. He's a na'ar. So there's something over-mature about this baby. This baby has, to, has had to grow up very fast. And he's, there he is, crying. Now, the Midrash then addresses this and has this to offer. Why is he both a baby and a half-grown man? Strange double way of seeing him. 
And the answer that's offered is, he was a baby, but his voice was like that of a young man. He had a voice on him, in him. He had a voice of tremendous, precocious authority and tremendous, precocious despair, making a demand of the world and seriously making a demand of the princess. So the princess experiences this baby as vulnerable, extremely vulnerable, and extremely demanding. It invades her life. It, makes, it, ma it asks something of her. In one extraordinary midrash, you read this. Um, what about this young man, Nar? And the association is made between that word as it's used here and as it's used in the book of Hosea. Ki na'ar Yisrael v'ohavehu. Where God praises Israel and says, Israel are eternally youthful. They have that kind of half-grown, immature, on the way to being mature quality. And I love him, says God. I love him for that for his constant sense of potential and struggle. And the Midrash connects the two verses. It's one of the tactics of Midrash to bring two verses to bear upon each other. And he says, when the princess, it says, when the princess looked at the baby, she saw Israel. She saw something about Israel. She saw something about, must be one of the ch children of the Hebrews, about the sorrow and despair and fear of the situation of Israelite babies at that time in a world that wanted them dead. And she sees all this, and she decides to become a mother to this motherless child, apparently. But... Going back to the original Midrash, someone answers the point about the voice and says, but if you say that, you are making Moses into a blemished person, a person with a disability of some kind. That he's a baby and he has this preternaturally loud and expressive voice. There's something uncanny about it. Do you really want to say that Moses had something uncanny and un, 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 indigestible about him? That he was just in some way really strange, an anomaly? Maybe yes. Maybe that's what the princess senses. She senses this is not a normal crying baby. It carries in its voice somewhere the past and the future of his people. And as that, now you see how the Midrash wants to extend the, the emotional range of the immediate scene. An ordinary baby's cry, if you're listening hard, you can actually hear all kinds of other things, depending on your associations, depending on what you know of, of the background of this child. And in this sense, therefore, Moses is immediately seen as representing an uncanny and difficult situation which the princess feels called upon to save him from. And the next thing that happens, the, 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 immediately after this, the next, the next uh, movement is that Miriam offers the princess to take the foundling and find a Hebrew wet nurse for the foundling. Since it clearly doesn't have a mother, nothing, the mother abandoned it, perhaps obeying Pharaoh's order, to throw all male children into the, into the, into the river, um, I'll go and find a wet nurse. And she goes and finds, of course, the mother, the true mother, who has the baby back then, fortuitously and providentially. You know, she can keep the baby now for a while and nurse the baby, but not as hers. The terms are made very clear. She nurses the baby with whatever private intent and passion, but the fact is, structurally, that this is not her baby anymore. She's nursing the baby for the princess, and that's the preposition that's used twice, that she is a hireling. She's a hireling wet nurse. Why, asks the Midrash, why does Miriam make this suggestion right away? And adds another, another layer to the drama. Perhaps the princess already tried to have the baby nurse from all her own personal wet nurses. Any, any self-respecting princess 
has always had a whole stable of, of wet nurses available to, to look after children. Velo yanak, but the baby would not nurse. The baby refused to suckle. And it's in response to that that Miriam says, maybe I'll go and try and get one from the Hebrews. Maybe the baby will feel more at home somehow. If, so it's a very thoughtful suggestion on the surface. But what does it leave us thinking with some imagination about Moses? Here, imagination is called for. So I'm suggesting that a baby who will not nurse when available milk is offered is a baby who's going to have trouble around his mouth. There's, it's a baby who is going to not be able to trust the world, not justified in trusting the world, as perhaps a normal baby should be. And therefore, that Moses, because of where he comes from, and because of where he's going to, what does the Midrash say on this? It's an extraordinary latch on the fact that the baby won't nurse. It says, the mouth, focusing on the mouth, orality, this is going to be very important. The mouth that is destined to speak with God shouldn't be nursing from foreign breasts. It should find a breast that it belongs to, to its own. Now, this mouth is not a baby's mouth anymore. It is a baby's mouth, but it's also a baby who is already haunted by its future, which will inhibit the baby from nursing. It won't be able to nurse just anywhere. It's a sign of a special holiness on the one hand. On the other hand, it's a sign of an inhibition. It means that in some way that mouth, as Moses will tell us plentifully later on, that mouth has all kinds of constrictions, all kinds of limitations. Yes, I'm not a man of words, Moses says at the burning bush. I am heavy of mouth and heavy of tongue. Quad peo quad lashon. Heavy means resistant somewhere, encumbered. I'm encumbered with my mouth and encumbered with my tongue. And the most grotesque and powerful image he uses, Moses uses of himself is I am of uncircumcised lips. That in some way there is something barring my, my lips. My lips are sealed shut. I can't open them sufficiently to let words out. As if I, this, this child that now grows, grows to be a man who feels himself unable to communicate with other human beings. Perhaps partly because of his destiny to speak with God, or perhaps because of the inhibition that comes from his origins, that comes from the fact that, that really Moses has two mothers to start with. Right? That's, that's a very dubious starting point, that no one knows necessarily where he comes from. Maybe the princess doesn't publicize it, that he is a Hebrew baby. Maybe the baby doesn't even know, and this is a suggestion, that I want to make, because it's never clarified in the text. Maybe the baby, when it comes to that day in the later development of the baby, becomes a young man, Moses. Vayetse, he's been brought up in the palace where the princess has brought him up as her own. Leven, she's taken the baby as a son. Why? Because she says, because I drew him out of the water. I Moshe mashiti. I drew him out of the water, meaning I took him from the jaws of death. I took him from a no place, and I made him mine. So therefore, I am his mother, and I have the right to name him, and he is forever my mother. So it's a very justified claim, in a certain sense, that it leaves Moses growing up as one of the palace, as a member of the palace, as the grandson of Pharaoh, until one day he leaves the palace. Vayetse. He leaves that interior which gave him meaning and position in the world. And he goes out because he wants to see the sufferings of his brothers out in the world, out there. And that expression, his brother, Hebrews, he wants to see that his Hebrews who are his brothers 
And, and he comes out and he sees, what is the first thing he sees is an Egyptian hitting, hitting hard, hitting to, to hurt, let's say at least. Makhe, this Hebrew who is one of his brothers. And then Moses gets enraged. Well, we don't read that exactly. His reaction is to kill the Egyptian and to bury him. The question I have to ask is this. We assume that Moses sees the Hebrew as one of his brothers. It, it reads that way. In other words, that he knows his origin. He's always known his origin, perhaps, and he comes out and he looks and he sees, oh, that's one of, my, that's one of mine. That's really what I'm curious to see. I came out to see the suffering of my brothers. I want to offer a different, maybe not, um, it's a possible interpretation, let me say. I think it's almost as good as the general one. And that is this. He doesn't know that he is a Hebrew. He has been brought up in the palace and there was no good reason for the princess to tell him. And we're never told that she tells him that he knows. Um, so he, he comes out and he sees someone being hit whom the narrator tell, reminds us is one of his brothers, right? That's that movement in literature that's called dramatic irony. The, the writer, the narrator is pointing out to the reader, you remember, don't you, <laughs> that these are actually his brothers. But Moses doesn't know this, that's the irony. Why does he kill the Egyptian? Because he realizes then that by virtue of being the inflictor of suffering, the Egyptian is not his brother. And by virtue of being the, the one who is being tormented, that man is his brother. But before he knows anything about the genetic situation that he is in. That is his first introduction to the world. When he leaves, is a, it's, a, it's a, a hybrid introduction of some kind. Does he know? Doesn't he know? There is a sense of looking for brothers. And he finds his brothers, for whatever reason, simply in this situation where the Hebrew has this, has this place. And that will mark him throughout the first stories of his life, that sense of a sensitivity to suffering. And that his identity is, is very largely shaped originally by this. Now, a Moses who leaves a world and finds himself a double outsider in the world out there, he is an outsider because he's the princess, the, the, uh, the princess's son. He's come, come with that status. He's an outsider also because what happens the following day, you remember? He comes back to the same scene and he sees two Israelites fighting each other. And now there is violence on both sides. How is he to identify his brother now? And of course, he immediately chooses to protect the one who is being attacked. That's what the text tells us. And in that sense, he's following through on yesterday, but with a sense of uneasiness. The uneasiness of knowing that even among my brothers, there are those who attack and there are those who are attacked. That there is, there is there's, there's an inequality of power that happens. And that's very disturbing. Right? It's, 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 it breaks something for Moses, but he has to learn how to, to work in a world like that for the sake of, for the sake of his future. That was the third scene. Number four, we're making progress. The fourth scene I want to point to is the burning bush, which happens immediately afterwards, very shortly afterwards. Um, burning bush, God speaks to him very shortly afterwards, chapter three. God speaks to him and introduces himself as the God of your father. And by this time, I really don't know how much of a revelation that is. Maybe it is a complete revelation. But what happens then is that God asks Moshe to, in the name of God, to go and redeem the people. And Moshe's reaction, Moses', Moses reaction then, is to, to say, first of all, here I am, the classic Hineni. Here I am, ready at your command. But immediately to follow that up with a question about himself. Mi anochi. But who am I? 
If you put the two words together, hineni mianochi, you get that movement of courage and responsiveness to a demand by God, and then a kind of reflexive movement back to oneself. But who am I that I should be the one to... The sentence follows, follows on, but I think that who am I is a kind of eternal question. We tend to think of it as a, as a peculiarly modern or postmodern question, but I think people have always asked themselves this. And here is Moses in a particularly hybridic situation, liminal situation, and God is choosing him for the role of hero, for the, the role of redeeming hero at, at this point. Not only that, but God then says to him, you will go and talk to the people and convey my promises to them, and they will listen to your voice. They will listen to your voice. And Moses responds, it's really quite striking, by saying, no, they won't. <laughs> uh, very, very firmly. I am heavy of mouth, heavy of tongue, not a man of words. You know, he, has, he has many things to say about how he can't talk. Um, I think it's quite striking that he's never so eloquent about what it's like to be him as when he's talking about his hindrances. What, what's stopping him? What's, what's blocking him? And there you feel that we're being given a sense, it's a highly psychoanalytic sense, it seems to me, of the way in which an identity is shaped by its vision of its possibilities and impossibilities, and the struggle that then has to ensue between Moses and God. God is quite angry at this resistance. You can, it says it in the text. But Moses refuses to go. God says they will listen to you, and Moses says no, they won't. There is an alternative reading of that too. I hope you're feeling flex flexible and agile. Um, and that is the reading of the Hermic Davar, 19, late 19th century um, Talmudic scholar who, is, who wrote a very in, in, innovative, a very creative uh, commentary on the Bible. And he suggests this, reading the words, they will listen to your voice. And he reads it differently. You can do that in Hebrew. He reads it, only if they listen to your voice will you be able to lead and redeem the people. Only if you let your voice be heard. Only if you produce a voice. If you overcome the barriers of who you may feel you are, if, if, the, if that's the condition, you will be an effective leader once you can get over that issue of the voice, of connection with others, of communication. Once you can get over that, then, and Moses refuses. Now, he's refusing here. His refusal is a much more serious matter. That, in a sense, redemption on this reading, it's a very challenging reading, can't proceed only by the will of God. God requires Moses' cooperation. I need your voice. And Moses doesn't want to let his voice be heard. Why not? And this is a suggestion I want to make. It's based on Kabbalistic sources, on Hasidic sources, something like this. That Moses, he has a double task now, to convey the message of God, the words of God, but he has to convey them in his own voice. He's willing to convey the message of God, for instance, suggests our commentary, quietly, privately to Aaron that Aaron, his brother, who is a speaker, he knows how to speak, Aaron will receive the message at second hand, and he will then broadcast to the people. That, he, he likes that idea. Then the message will come across loud and clear, and it won't be hampered by my stutterings and stammerings and issues, all my the issues that affect my voice. I won't suddenly go husky, I won't suddenly tremble, I won't, it, we'll have a clear message. That's, that's a good situation. And God insists here, it has to be your voice. It's your voice combined with the message that gives it a certain power. Not because you have a particularly good voice, 
but because, and here I'm quoting from a wonderful book by Alfonso Lingis um, called The Community of Those Who Have Nothing in Common. What joins people together from different parts of the world? People who have nothing in common. Let's assume that. There's no common discourse. What joins people together? Lingus's argument, Lingus was the translator of Levinas, uh, incidentally. Um, his, his, his suggestion is this. He says, normally we think the message is something that has to be abstracted, extracted from the background noise. Somewhere that is an effort of communication, that you listen to someone speaking and it may be clouded and blurred by external noise or even the noise that's internal to the utterance, quoting Lingus, that when a human being speaks out of a body and out of a past and out of inhibitions and sufferings of various kinds, then the voice is surrounded by kind of noise there may be some stuttering, there may be unclarity, there may be repetition, there may be a huskiness here and there, in order to get the, the true message across. Two possibilities. One is you clear away all the noise, all the interference, and then you can hear pure the, 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 the words. But what is being advocated here by Lingus is the need for a complete communication of having all the background noise, all the interference is part of how a human being communicates with another human being. We bring not only our words, but we bring our presence, the light in our eyes, the warmth of our hands, our embodied situation. And that affects the voice, even if it doesn't affect the words. And what God wants of Moses at this point is something like that. And Moses can't, won't do it. He doesn't trust all that blur, all the, person, the personal issues that will affect and in some way disturb his voice. He doesn't trust enough for that at this, at this moment. In this sense, um, I, would, I would add that Moses, Moses in the, is in the position that Lingus describes and he said there are three, says there are three liminal moments in a human life where this issue of the voice becomes very all important. Birth in the moment of eros, in the moment of love, and death. These are moments where articulate self-expression are not exactly primary. When a baby is born, we don't listen for a message in his words. We listen to the sound of his voice. That is eloquent. Right. At the moment of love, it's not, no one gives a lecture. Right. At that moment, there are sounds, there are noises of various kinds that communicate. And especially at the moment of death, he lays great emphasis on that. At the moment of death, when one is afraid to come and keep company with the dying, what will I say to them? Have I anything to say? The answer that Lingus offers is, that you are not offering them words. You have to speak words, but it really doesn't matter so much. What you have to offer them is yourself, your living self, with the light and the warmth and the ground under your feet, offering to, to accompany this person who is moving away from this world. And that was, is a, that's an aspect of communication that can't be underestimated. Moses has a lot of trouble with that. Call it the unconscious trans transmissions of language. I want, in a way, there's a desire to control. I want to know exactly what I'm telling the people at any, at any given moment. From this, we move to the sin, Mount Sinai and the sin of the golden calf. And this is, of course, a major one. What is Moses' role in the revelation and in the sin of the golden calf. Structurally, again, it's very clear that during the revelation, Moses goes up the mountain, goes down the mountain, goes up the mountain, goes down the diamond mountain. I haven't, got it, I haven't quite cleared up how many times he, he's up and down. 
That is, he's between two places. He's talking to God and receiving. He's going down. Until there comes a time, 40 days after the moment of revelation, where the people make a golden calf, and Moses go, goes up the mountain unsuspecting of what's about to happen, that the people are going, what they're going to do in his absence. And God says to him, Lech red. Sharp Hebrew words, two imperatives, lech red, get on down there, go down, yes, go down to them. You don't belong up here, you belong down there. Now there is Moses excluded from the one place where I, I would have to say if he had to choose between being up on the top of the mountain talking to God and being at the bottom trying to deal with the people, um, he, he much prefers the, uh, the inward situation of being with God. And God rejects him, in a sense. He, he, he moves him, he interrupts him, and he says, I don't need you here. And the Midrash is quite curt about this. Lamali. What, now that the people have sinned, your place is down there with them, not up here with me. What do I need you for? I need you in your role with the people, just where you find it most difficult to be. That, that's, that's where you must be. And this, 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 this expression, lech red, occurs at the golden calf moment, and even before that, when Moses what, goes up the mountain, and he, wants to, he would really like to stay up there for the revelation. And then God says to him, no, 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 for the revelation, you go down there. You, you be with your people. So twice this is, this is repeated. And so there's that sense that Moses can't really come to rest easily in any one place, that each place has its, has its issues, has, has, has something to complicate things for, for him. Who is Moses viewed from a larger perspective? If I can move outwards a little bit. I'm, con I'm thinking of a very famous Talmudic midrash, which the Maharal, the great 16th century uh, Jewish philosopher, discusses in one of his books, and it's the situation of a baby who's born into the world, classic situation. In this case, a Jewish baby is born into the world. <clears throat> as soon as he comes out into the air of the world, yatsala avir ha'olam, he leaves an internal atmosphere, which is not just the atmosphere of the mother's womb, but of the heavens themselves, of, of a purely spiritual reality. He leaves that, that supernal reality, and he emerges into the world. What's the first thing that happens is that an angel comes and strikes the baby on its mouth. This is a Neoplatonic Neo myth adopted by the rabbis. And that's why we have that little dent on our mouths. Um, and the baby then forgets everything it knew before. That, that little blow of oblivion. Now you, you're, 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 you're a slate wiped clean. And you now go out into the world and fun function as best you can. The Maharal comments on this Talmudic Midrash in a very powerful, concentrated way. He says, Moses, uh, no, we haven't got to Moses yet. Babies come out into the world, and at that very moment, they forget that purely spiritual, intellectual being they had before. And they're born into a world of loss. They've lost something. They have lost this total power to hold all the light within themselves. And they come out into the world, and by way of compensation, the angel strikes on the mouth, which is to open the child's mouth to language. Now the child can begin to speak. So forgetting and speaking go together. You've forgotten what made speech irrelevant, and now you're in a world that is limiting and constricting and therefore reaches deep inside you for what you can offer, what you can bring out of the mouth. Now, that discussion in the Maharal has a little coda to it, just to stimulate one's imagination. And he says, Moses was never struck on the mouth. He is that rare child who is born into a world in which he knows too much. He has been exposed to things that he can't forget. And therefore, he never really learns to speak. 
And the, the, the narrative that I would like to suggest now becomes Moses' narrative, given this uh, sense of his, his, uh, his origin, is what something like this. When Moses says, I'm not a man of words, I'm not a, a language person, I'm heavy of mouth, I'm circum uncircumcised lips, cumulatively, all these self-descriptions of a kind of discomfort around language also become a recognition of a limitation of his being. I am limited by the fact that I'm not limited. I'm limited by the fact that no one ever struck me on the mouth. And therefore, I'm too much in contact with a spiritual reality. And it's very hard, therefore, there's an abundance, too much of an abundance of light. I can't bring it out into the world. And Moses begins to realize the shortcomings of such a situation. And gradually, he speaks in the negative about it. You know, I'm not this. I'm not, I'm not yet. In other words, Moses begins to have a sense a growing sense that if he is to function in the world as God wants him to do, he's going to have to, in a way, come down into the world. He's going to have to enter into the human world to become more human. Which is not to say that he's not human. He eats and he drinks and he, he gets married. He is, but it's always a feeling of not quite. He's qu not quite human. He can't quite talk to his people. Whereas he talks with great comfort to God, with great, with, with great ease to God. When he comes down the mountain for the last time, after he has negotiated the, uh, the non-destruction of his people for the sin, he comes down and he doesn't realize, says the Midrash. He doesn't, uh, sorry, sorry, the text. The text says he comes down the mountain and he doesn't know, lo yada that his face is radiating light. He's unaware of the fact that there are rays of light coming out of his face. Karan or, that is, the skin of his face, it's very physiological, <laughs> all right? So the skin of his face has, is radiating light. He, he's unaware of it. And then he sees that people are afraid to approach him. And he starts trying to speak to them. And he, the word to speak is used in that short passage seven times as if to say, this is now, this is a crisis for him. There is something about him that, that repels people, that frightens people, that attracts people, perhaps. But there's a way of communication that he has to, he has to develop. And he speaks to them. And then we have this strange uh, solution to his problem, a word that is used that's never used before, and I think never again in the Bible. There is a, he wears a mask on his face. Masve, some kind of camouflage on his, on his face, so that people can't really see the light. Right. They see the light only through this, this mask. And then there's a kind of unclarity. I don't want to go into the details of the language here, but there's a kind of unclarity in the, in the, in the narrative where the structure of his relationships now is put like this. He, when, when he speaks to God, he has the mask off. They are open to the light of God. When he, is, when he is with the people, when he comes out of the tent of assembly, comes out of the, of the, of the uh, tabernacle, from speaking to God, he comes out and he puts the mask on his face so that the people can't see it. And they're not therefore affected by this kind of liminal quality that, that he represents. I belong here and I don't belong here. And again, the Hamik Davar, again, the same commentary, offers a Kabbalistic type um, solution. And he says, this is what he says. He says, there actually are three positions. Because if you look at the passage, it seems that the people can see the light when he's teaching them. They can and they can't. You read it one way, they can't. You read it the other way, they can. And so the Hamik Davar suggests this, that Moses when he comes out from speaking to God, he rolls up, I'm sorry, he, he, uh, he comes out from speaking to God and he wears, the then he wears the mask on the top of his head, rolled up, ready to descend. So
so that there are three positions, mask on, mask off, and then a kind of intermediary position in which the people can see the light of his face when he's teaching them Torah. That's the one time where his light is in evidence. But they have, are aware of that framework, that there's a, a curtain about to descend. And so that Moshe can, Moses can somewhere protect his privacy, something of his spirituality, of his lone times with God. And at the same time, have the people enjoy the radiance of his face in the learning of Torah, in, it, specifically in that spiritual practice. And based on this, there is a direction to all teachers uh, in the future. And this, of course, is written from the point of view of the 19th century, the Hamik Devar in the 19th century says it's very important when you teach a group of people Torah that they shall see your face. To see the light of your face. And it's based on a verse in Isaiah that your, your, uh, your pupils shall see your face. That is, the face as a teaching means. The face, the voice, the humanity as a teaching means as a, 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 a didactic aid of some kind. And Moses now is being in, introduced into the inner issues, the inner depths of what it means to radiate light in a world in which people both need to see that light and are put off by it in some way, feel that this is a stranger, this is someone who, who doesn't quite belong to us. Perhaps what is being achieved here through that folded up veil is a kind of intimate collaboration between student and teacher. I am here for you, the teacher says to the student. Please offer me hospitality. Please take me in. Don't, don't, don't think of me as uncanny, that here I am and I'm here for you. On the one hand, there, there is that. Uh, on the other hand, there is the sense that there is some kind of limit to that form of, end, of communication and that there is still a place left for a kind of inwardness, for a depth and an inwardness in both the teacher and the student. The student, in the end, is left alone to struggle with what the teacher has given and to bring it into some kind of intimate intercourse with what was already there in the student. The Torah can't come to life says the Hamik Dovar, until there is a student who is willing to make sense, imaginative sense, internal sense of what he or she has been taught. It isn't a pure implantation of something. The teacher doesn't implant material into the student. Which reminds me of Emerson, since you quoted Emerson. Um, one of very, it's a very famous passage, of course. And it goes like this. Um, I'll quote one sentence of it. In every work of genius, we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. In every work of genius, we recognize our own alienated thoughts. Thoughts we have rejected, perhaps repressed. Alienation in the 19th century when Emerson lived had to do with ghosts, aliens ghosts, uncanny creatures. That is the sense that there are some of our thoughts that we don't want to acknowledge, and we put them aside. And then you read a work of genius, and you have this bittersweet experience that someone else said what you couldn't say. Someone else said what you wouldn't say. And someone else brought into the world, therefore. So it's, like, it's that kind of alienated majesty, which basically is yours. Otherwise, how would you recognize it? If it wasn't yours, how would you recognize it? Stanley Cavell, uh, the philosopher, has a wonderful passage on this in which he says this. What good does it do to read a book, for instance? If the thoughts of the writer are yours, then you don't need the book. If the thoughts of the writer are not yours, what good is the book going to do you? How are you, how are you, how are you going to make anything if you don't have it in you? And Cavell answers then, this is his, his, his answer, which uh, has to do everything to do with transitionality of being on the margins. He says, the truth is, think of it this way, the thoughts of, in the book are 
neither exactly mine nor not mine. Thoughts are not yours and not yours, or not yours. What they represent is your further, next, unattained, but attainable self. The thoughts in the book are there in some way to stimulate a possible self in yourself. If there weren't the germs of that self already in existence, they would fall on barren ground. And therefore, any act of reading, Emerson says, with, a very, I think, a very deep sense of rabbinic truth here, um, any act of reading cannot be simply implanting the thoughts of the writer into the reader. He calls that idolatry. And instead, um, Cavell calls his reading of this, calls it a theology of reading. If there isn't that in me that can receive and make something, of the text, and then the text falls on deaf ears. And that is the hope of the teacher, and that's the hope of the writer. The psalmist put it very beautifully. Lule Torah as Where the psalmist celebrates the word of God and says, if your Torah had not been my delight, Sha'ashua, but actually the word means plaything, if it hadn't been something I can play with, then I should have perished in my affliction. I, sh I should have long been gone. If I hadn't had this very serious form of play available to me, which is provided by your Torah, that it makes me live. There's a kind of vitality that it connects with inside the self. Sometimes one has to go very deep to find it. And it's not always a matter of pious imaginings. It's a matter of a kind of full life in whatever situation one finds oneself in. It's not, it's not just a matter of certain circumscribed imaginings, but a live imagination to encounter the um, complexities of the human situation. And with this, we go move to the last passage of what I wanted to, to discuss with you. And that is the moment of death. The moment when Moses would desperately like to go into the land. And the book of Deuteronomy begins with Moses on quite close to the beginning, chapter 3. With Moses reporting to the people. And that's going to be our main question now. Why does Moses tell the people this story? He reports to the people God said to me at that time, at a certain juncture, God said to me, Al Tosef Daber Eli Od Moses had been pleading to be allowed to go into the land, using every possible argumentation, and God had answered him rather harshly, Stop right there, don't go on talking to me about this thing of your entry into the land. Moses yearning to enter the land, which is of course a yearning of a deeply spiritual and also very, very bountiful kind. He wants to be with his people in their moment of coming into themselves. He wants to be there and God says, don't even talk about it anymore. And that is a very harsh response. And Moses reports that to the people. So here is our final conundrum that we'll find mid ample midrashic response. Why on earth would Moses choose to report this scene of humiliation, where God not only refuses his prayer, but actually, in a way, refuses intercourse with him anymore? He says, all right, you've always talked to me, and we have, we've had a very good relationship all along. You know, I told you things, and you accepted them, and you conveyed them, and everything... But that's enough already. Stop talking to me about this thing. And so I'd like to read this like this. This is the end of your time of talking to me. Now really get back down the mountain and do what's required now for the future. And that is to start talking to the people. Tell them this story. In a way, it's even hinting that. God is poteach lo petach. You know, God is just opening a little opening in the word to me. Stop talking to me about these things. Go and talk to the people. And what Moses does, and this is amplified in a number of Midrashic sources, it's quite an insistent theme. 
about Moses at the verge, Moses a few months before he dies, is that the last project of his life is to translate, to translate his desire to go across to the Holy Land, that's the word that's used, la avor, to cross over to the Holy Land, to make that move, that final move to the Holy Land, into an other desire, to develop another horizon of desire, and that is to come across to his people, as he never has before. To pass, to pass across, la avor, in modern Hebrew we say, is the message, is the message coming over? Yeah. Somewhere to compensate for his deficiencies in some way, that the people should really feel the impact of his relationship with them in a full and generous way. And this is achieved, perhaps surprisingly, by a technique of Moses sharing with them his most mixed feelings, his most complex and mixed feelings about his story, about his fate, about God, by reporting to the people that God wouldn't let me, what is he actually implying to the people? According to a number of these midrashic sources, it would be lovely if we had time to develop it, but I'll try to say it as clearly as possible. What we have here is Moses saying to the people, I have always hinted to you, but you didn't hear the hint, that I need you to be intuitive. I need you to be imaginative, not just people who can take in passively the message. If you could hear imaginatively what I was really asking you for when I spoke to you on a certain important occasions, including now at the very end, where Moses keeps on saying to them, you are going across to the Holy Land. You know, you are going across to the Holy Land, and I'm not going across. Now, that poignant implication, emphasizing you're going across, the implication is I'm not. And Moses actually displaying now to the people in a way that they can either pick up on or not, that what he needs from them at this final moment is their full adoption of him as part of them, to take him in and to pray for him, to pray for him as they would pray for themselves, that he should be able to go into the land. And he can't ask them this directly, According to the Midrash, it's quite clear. You can't say to, well, maybe the really crass uh, candidate can say to his electorate, uh, I want you to love me. Uh, I want you to choose me. I want you to want me. But Moses can't do that. So Moses is left somewhere within his loneliness, appealing to the people in a way that you either hear or you don't hear. And the people didn't hear. And Moses is now reproaching the people partly, is saying, you know, you really are quite insensitive. So it's not, it's kind of tough talk there at the end. Moses is really coming out from undercover and relating to the people with a kind of reality and a kind of truth about the fact that he's totally implicated with them. That he wants, this is his whole, his whole destiny, to be, to be with them. Are you with me as I am with you? If you are, and this is the hope at the end of the book, if you are, you will always remember, in a sense, this late process that I brought you through of deeper understanding, not just listening to the surface of the words, to the obvious brunt of the message, but listening. Where is there a repeated word? Where is there a gap? Where does my reading come into play? Where does my imagination come into play? Without that ability, what is, what is left? There'll be a text. There'll be a holy text. With that ability of Havana, of intuitive understanding, you have the oral law. You have the capacity to speak in the people, which is a capacity to speak out of a desire to play with the text, to collaborate with the text, to make it sacred rather than idolatrous, which it can only be if there is that collaboration. Liot im hakadosh baruch to be with God and not just you know, implanted by the word of God. And that, perhaps, is Moses' final achievement. That is, the, in the end, 
we're given to understand, and I'll, I'll quote the verse in a moment, it again is, needs, needs a lot of reading, um, we're given to understand that Mo Moses has succeeded in this, that the people have been sensitized by his more complex and personal and humanized way of speaking, with plenty of noise in it, right? not a clear message. Um, and they've been, they've been affected by this, and that Moses has become what in the end, for eternity, will be his role. How do we, in, in Judaism, we always talk about Moses, our teacher. The encomium goes with it. Who is Moses? Not the prophet, yeah, not the man of God, although these are all valid descriptions, but Moshe Rabbeinu. And it's always a kind of intimacy about it. He's one of us. He's one of us in being mixed, in, being, in having plenty of noise there. Right? A normal baby, even when struck on the mouth, is still going to end up you know, somewhere a mixed being. That's when real, real mixing will start, where complexity begins. And Moses stakes his claim in the end as a teacher, as someone who has studied and been taught by God in a certain way, and now is translating that to the people and what he hopes to achieve throughout the ages, we still credit him with it, is the capacity to read texts. But within the Jewish tradition, that will be a kind of major capacity. That will be what, what, what we, we feel is vital to us, that play capacity, a very serious form of play. Uh, how do we read it at the end there? I promised your last verse. God shows him the land from the top of Mount Nebo. He says, there you can see it, north, south, east, and west. It's actually a rep repetition of what we already know in the text, that he's looking around in all directions. And then God says to him, and these are the last words of God, extraordinarily harsh. Vishama lota avor. There you will not cross over. Look, you're filled but you will not cross over there. And that's the last thing God says. So I'm doing a little creative reading now, and I want to read it with an emphasis on Shama. You're not going to, you're not going to cross over there, but you have crossed over successfully to the people. You've initiated a certain kind of reading relationship for the future, which affects, which affects one's spiritual being is a feeling somewhere of a dynamic that continues to connect one with the revelation of God at Sinai and with Moses, our teacher. Thank you.